Welcome to Prophecy Review, or what we like to say here, Prophecy America. Because what we're going to discuss, how we're going to approach the subject of prophecy, how we're going to understand the revelation of what God is doing in this land, is to recognize the fact that, one, America is not in prophecy. Now that's a fact. I know there have been false teachers. Hagee is one. Blitz is another. Khan has tried to present himself as a rabbi, so I guess he could be listed as a false teacher, though I prefer to call him a false prophet. But many people have lied bluntly about America in prophecy. And so, because they have, and because they do, we started this series, Prophecy America, to speak to you, Americans, about what is true and factual about prophecy and what is actual that is going on in prophecy and why you should be aware of these things that are happening but more so be looking for that aspect of the revelation of Jesus in your life more so now than ever before. For you were born for such a time as this. You have been especially created and called into being for such a time as you live in right now. You are the one. So having said that, Prophecy America is about where, how, what, and why are we about, in, not in, or where do we locate and interlocute, and how come we're not, or how come we are, in prophecy. Well, here at Prophecy America, we take the very sure word of God and apply it logically physically, spiritually, by the Spirit of God to where we live right now in life as we exist as human beings in this land that we call the United States of America. As we look outward, we also have to look inward because the spirit of prophecy is about Jesus and the spirit of prophecy is revelatory. It reveals things. God by His Spirit wants to reveal in us His Son but before he does that, he reveals in us sin. He causes us to recognize that we are fallible. We are not perfect, nor is America the great white hope of God unto the nations. That's why in Prophecy America, we will say it a lot. America is not in prophecy. That's a fact check. You cannot put America anywhere in the book of books, the Bible itself, the Word of God, no matter how you squeeze it, sneeze it, tweeze it, dissect it, rearrange it, make up some kind of cult like the Yahuas and the Yahushuas and the Yahoo Yahoos and the who knows what else they're going to come up with. But liars lie, and if you catch a prophecy teacher in a lie, you should walk away and not ask why because he is going to lie once, he will lie twice, and he will lie in his own lie. Having said that, we too in this ministry are questionable. We are those who have said, starting in 2017 through 2034, there is an 80% probability of the coming of the Lord. Listen again, we have said in this ministry, Vidigo Church, Vidivo Prophecy, Vidivo, me, Michael James Stone, Prophecy Updates, Prophecy Watch, Biblical Prophecy Today, Last Generation Network News, all the affiliates, we have said as part of this, Prophecy America, Jesus is coming sooner than you think. He's right around the corner. He's knocking at your door. As a matter of fact, if you would sit still long enough, you would listen and hear him speak. He bids unto you come, and the Spirit and the Bride are saying come, because behold, from 2017 through 2034, the probability of his soon return is 
boom, replay it, record it, write it down, make it a play, make it a song, make it a limerick. That's a fact, Jack. Saying that doesn't mean that we as Americans are playing a big role in prophecy. We are and we aren't. And that's why Prophecy America is going to present some things to you that are literally things you have to think about. You have to come to a conclusion based upon your study of the word. We're not going to tell you follow us. Hey, you're insane if you follow me. You follow Jesus and no one else. If your church benefits you, go to church. If your pastor is a blessing to you, go to your pastor. If your priest is a blessing, go to your priest. But I can tell you, in these latter days, don't go looking. Be found somewhere in the Word. And I don't care where. I don't care if you're a Mormon, a Catholic, a Protestant, a atheist, a Calvary Chapel, a vineyard, a whatever it is that they're doing now down in Reading, I forget what that's called, and whatever they're doing down in Australia, and I forget what that's called, and they moved over to New York, and you know, all the worship kind of focused interest groups. Who can keep track of everything that's going on in the world? God can. You see, we don't have a problem with knowing facts. We don't have a problem with knowing the truth. As a matter of fact, our positional statement literally is you can't know by your own understanding. The, bo the bottom line is that Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not in your own understanding. But remember that. Lean not in your own understanding. In other words, I don't care how much faith you got. I don't care how much education you got. I don't care how much relationship you got. You do not lean in your own understanding. You will go wrong every time. You will find the scriptures true in prophecy that says we are deceived by ourselves. And even God will send a deception and all he has to do is just whisper in your ear and you'll follow it. Listen to Jonathan Kahn for very long and you'll begin to believe that there are harbingers in Bibles. There are, oh my God, you know, there was a miracle that happened at the Twin Towers. Oh, we found the Tree of Liberty, and it was like, oh, we saw a vision. We put on golden glasses, you know, we came up with a new relationship with God. I mean, everything that Khan is saying almost sounds like a Mormon revelation of the Book of Mormon. I mean, no offense to you, but I'm Jewish, and I know he's wrong. I know he's lying. I know he's a false prophet. He came on the scene because he was a nobody to become a somebody, and becoming a somebody, he suddenly felt like he was somebody, and so he was led by his own self-deception. Pride entered into his ego, and now he portrays himself as all these new things coming out of Jewish traditions. Oh, yeah, we've got something good for you. Today we've got a special, two for the price of one. Ha, ah, well, forget it, we'll get three for one. I mean, a man is making money off you Gentiles, Christians. He is getting paid wealthily and using it where? You tell me. Go there. You'll find this man is not pure of heart and he is not serving the living God. He is serving himself. And even Haman, who knew, not Haman, even uh, Haman, well, yeah, he is a Haman. <laughs> but even Balak, the king, knew that Balaam could be bought. So Balaam, a prophet of God, was used by God still, but guess what? As a false prophet, he still had to answer to God. Khan is a Balaam, and you better watch it, baby, because he will deceive you. He deceived Hagi. They both came up with blood moon sacrifices and all kinds of stupid things you're looking for. I mean, the superstitions in 2016 got the heyday of every day looking for Jesus coming back. And we told you all along in 2016, Jesus is not coming back in 2016. Jesus is not coming back, and we said it in 2015. In 2015, we said it in 14, in 13, in 12, 11, and 10. We've been saying it since the year 2000, to put it bluntly. No, he's not coming back yet. No, not this year. Maybe, you know, in the future, like about, oh, 2017. And so we started in 2017. There's a 70-year prophecy that probably is why we came up with the probabilities of 80% starting in 2017 and may have picked that year based primarily upon the 70 years prophecy when it came to Israel and the nations. A, I don't know that that's the only prophecy that would have been factored into the 
the numerical equivalencies that we have come up with, not in the sense of we use numbers, but that we mathematically computed all the prophecies, crunched the numbers, and see where would the probability be with error factors and truth factors mixed in. And so we did come up with 2017 through 2034. Now there's one of the people that we incorporated in our studies that actually has extended his timetable to be from 2030 to 2040. Personally, I haven't read his new material, so I'm not going to go there. Some of the things that he teaches I have agreed with and seen that it was accurate. Some things I know he's inaccurate about, and he admits he's inaccurate about. So I have no problem with him because he can admit fallibility. And that's why we look at probability. We're not going to stand up and say, this is the day Jesus is coming. We're going to tell you, well, yeah, no man knows the day or the hour. Never mind, there's a feast called the day that no man knoweth the day or the hour, but that's okay. We won't go there because I don't want to scare you or I don't want to deceive you. It's a rare statement made that way. It's also called the feast of born again every time you have a new month. There are certain feasts that are called the new year. There are certain aspects of the Feast of Trumpets, the feast that is going to be the sounding of the shofar, that you have to be able to hear it and then be aware of it for a certain amount of days, ten days, some say seven, that collate exactly with what Jesus said about the bride and the bridegroom. Behold, the bridegroom cometh! Go out to meet him! Now, I'm not going to be one to stand here and sit here or do whatever I'm doing here and tell you go out to meet him Although I might during that feast say, hey, you know what, you might want to go outside and take a look in the east and see if there's a star. The star was the sign of his coming. People have come up with red moons. They've come up with the sun getting hotter. They've come up with uh, solar ejections of magnetic material. They've come up with um, Planet X. They've come up with Nibiru. They've come up with UFOs. They come up with a lot of things except sticking with the one thing that was true then that is true now and is going to be true in the future. The sign of his coming is a star. That's obvious. Duh! It's almost like when uh, hey, King Herod says, uh, where's this uh, king of the Jews to be born? And, uh, you know, the scribes and the Pharisees looked at him like, Duh! You're the king and you don't know? Bethlehem, Ephrata. For thou, O Bethlehem, Ephrata, art the least among, but from thee shall come a ruler, king of over Israel. Duh! And it was obvious to the wise men coming out of the east to the place where Jesus was born. If it was so obvious to them, why don't we know the sign of his coming? Why are we saying that it's a red moon? Why are we saying it's a bloody moon? Then how come we're saying that it's a tetrad of moons? First of all, it was one red moon. Then it didn't happen that year, so then it was about three red moons. Then it was about four red moons. Then it was about only a certain set of red moons that were going to happen, and each time there would be a catastrophe that didn't happen. And then we look back in history, and they say that it happened during those red moons, and we look back and examine it factually. They got the dates wrong. So what do you do with that? You have to say, false, wrong, hello, dude, you didn't get the message. You're lying or you've been deceived. Now, I personally like Hagee on some things. I think he's a genuine, sincere Christian. I think he's been genuinely, sincerely deceived. I think a lot of that happens when you get a huge following or you sell books. I think a lot of people that um, I just recently was um, removed from Christ in prophecy. Fascinating, but okay. You know, and they have, as it were, taking over for the original Dr. Reagan, um, a young man that is taken over for him and, you know, makes his own decisions and has his own shtick going. But even with Reagan, we're talking money. These guys make some money off of selling books. They have to keep selling a new idea. There's even like the blind guy that's now part of prophecy, something that's doing this, that, and the other thing. And while he was right on some things, he's wrong on others, and he's now selling a new book about gaps. Baby, I got a gap in my teeth, but other than that, there ain't no gaps in the Bible. I'm sorry, that's stupid. It's to try to compensate with something that we don't know by saying something we do know, and then creating something that no one ever heard of. No one ever heard of a gap before Christianity. Gap? You tell a Jew there's a gap in the Bible, he's going to look at you like, what'd you do, put a hole in it? I mean, that's bottom line. There's no gaps. 
There's no idea that somehow this, you know, God started here and then he picked up back here, you know, and then suddenly, you know, oh, there's God. There ain't no gaps. God doesn't work that way. Otherwise, why don't you just fall into the gap and buy some new shoes or buy some Levi's or something, you know, like the old commercial says. In other words, there's a lot of false ideas out there, which is why Prophecy America is here now talking about false teachers. Because we want to tell you, don't fall into the gap. Don't fall for false teachers. Don't fall for Jewish preachers. What am I? <laughs> Shop liver? Well, you see, I'm not going to tell you not to fall for me. Hey, personally, my wife fell for me, so you might as well too. But other than that, no, you don't have to accept what I have to say. I'm telling you what not to do. Don't follow me. Follow Jesus. Study to show thyself approved. To work with them need not be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Applying the principles that you've been warned of. Don't be an itching ear. Don't be a seeking soul that wants to know how much money you're going to make next year. And I'll tell you, the people that anointed Donald Trump and claim he's a Christian made a lot of money off of that. They did. They got wealthy donations and their ministries are being subsidized. That's the way it works. Sorry, if you haven't seen if you haven't seen or been a church secretary or worked behind the scenes, I got news for you. It's a gimmick, man. A lot of people are making some money, honey. And it's just like, well, you know, don't forget to tie it. And by the way, you know, our speaking engagement costs this much, and this is what our cost was in order to fly here, and this is what we need in order to cover just cost. Right? Right? Cost, cost. Got it? Got it? Huh? Yeah? Okay. And the rabbi calls and says, hey, you know, I haven't seen you in a while. And he says, I'll send you five grand. Okay. Click. You never hear from the rabbi again. Works in the Jewish culture. We do it. I was the rabbi's assistant. I called up people in order for them to sponsor the Chabad calendar. Hello? And guess how we did it? Uh, the rabbi wants to talk to you, rabbi. Okay, five grand? Sure, no problem. Hello? It is corruption. It is evil. It is not prophecy. And that's why we say America is not in prophecy. Take it to the bank. Now, saying that, you're going, but I thought you were going to talk about America in prophecy. Well, I'm going to say prophecy in America. How's that? Let's reverse it a little bit, because prophecy is overall, about all, and incorporates all. Because after all, Jesus is all in all. He is the Son of God, the Son of Man. He is God incarnate. He is the physical representation of the manifestation of what we call God, that God is, who God is the Spirit, and we can only know Him by looking at Jesus, for if we see Jesus, we've seen the Father, but otherwise when we see Him, well, you know, the best we'll come up with maybe is a consuming fire, maybe a uh, imagery of some kind of, you know, glow, or we don't know. We know the book of Revelation describes God as, you know, there, literally, physically, and what John saw we can only take to the bank, because everything else is some nut telling me that he's been to heaven and back. You know, it's like, really? What'd you see? I saw, you know, like there were rows and rows of BMWs and, you know, Porsches over here and Cadillacs over there, you know, and God gave me a blessing, you know, to give to you. Just send me five bucks. Buy my book. Honey, if there's money involved, it is already partially wrong. I'm not going to say every prophecy person out there selling books is wrong. They got to make their money, you know, they got to make their quota or they got to make their, you know, living. So, I guess so. You know, Balak paid Balaam, so you know so what it is so about money. So, why would you assume to follow me? I don't get any money out of this. I don't get anything out of it. Matter of fact, we don't get. We give. Everything we have, we give away. That's why we have such a crummy camera. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for my crummy camera. But can I get a new one? And we're going to try to get a new one this week, this Friday. It's used. It, I, I hope it's not abused, but it's used. It's cheap. And it's so inexpensive that it's almost embarrassing to say how much. Forty bucks. You know, I'd hate to admit that, you know, we're going to spend forty bucks on, you know, something that we're going to have to take out of our food budget in order to, you know, support the ministry. But that's how God provides us. 
We just get it and God increases it. I'll take that $40 for a camera and I'll go out to the grocery store and with the missing 40 bucks find $40 in sales. Believe it or not. I used to work grocery, so I know. I, sometimes I go out on the right days, I get all these wicked... <laughs> I get deals you've never even heard of. I am still paying the same price for most of my groceries that I paid 20 years ago. And my wife just looks at me dumbfounded because she knows I'm right. It's not because they changed the 16-ounce can to a 14-ounce can to a 10-ounce can. Now, some of you, maybe you fell for that in the grocery industry. You know, What you paid didn't go up, but you got smaller size cans and portion sizes. They tried to maneuver that because grocery prices went up. Well, I don't buy brand new groceries all the time. I find cheap deals here, and I'll go to a Mexican store there, or a meat market here, or Carceneria, you know, over here, or Carson Ascent, Carson, you got it, Carceneria, Carson, Carson, Carceneria. I can't remember. Sometimes my Spanish goes with my Jewish, and I get Yiddish all screwed up. <laughs> Such a deal. So when we talk about our ministry, it's getting from God to give to you, the people. We say it in Video Church this way. The Word of God by the Spirit of God to the people of God of the Son of God, Jesus. So it's all about, any way you look about, find investigate, correlate, correlate, or in any way try to aggravate me by trying to provoke me, it's all about Jesus. I mean, I don't really care what you do. You can go to heaven or you can go to hell for all I care because I may love you, but I'm not going to stop you from going to hell and diving right in the lake of fire. And you can tell me that hell doesn't exist or that Sheol and playing with Hadiz and playing with you know Gehenna and doing all the other word name, let's just defame what the Bible says and try to change it so that we don't go with that game but somehow wind up in fame so we can get away with what we want now as opposed to being condemned once we die and stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Then if we're not there, be condemned by the judgment seat of God because we are raised then to stand before God Almighty and go to hell. Either way, Jesus will send you to hell just as easily as God the Father will. I got news for you. The sheep and the goats isn't some kind of blessing in disguise. Hey, you know what? We're going to skip one and take door number two. You know, Jesus is going to let us slide because he loves us. You may want to read the sheep and the goats a little closer. Bad, bad. No, they were good. The goats, nah, nah. They had a lot to chew on, and it wasn't in heaven. Just warning you. You may want to re-examine your, you're going to hear this word a lot, truisms. Because you have the truth, which is Jesus, and you have truisms from man. Truisms are assumed facts put into play that are false. It's a statement from logic. You'll hear us in Prophecy America teach, preach, and talk a lot about fallacy. It's one of the things about logic that is used against people to deceive you. There are ad hominem attacks. There are... Oh, boy. <laughs> There's 32 logic traps that you can use in order to trick people into coming up with the wrong conclusion. False comparisons. You know, if you, then. If this, that. If so, be so. I mean, it's kind of like Proverbs. You know how Proverbs has one part and the other part? The good news, the bad news? Well, it's kind of like trying to show a scale, but it's tipped against you. And it's intellectually using your thought process against you to come up with the wrong conclusion. And it's done in politics, in advertising, in religion, in evangelical circles. A lot of preaching is done with fallacies involved. I mean, I myself have to catch myself unless I do to myself the same thing other people are doing to others even if I did it to myself. Creating a fallacy of myself. I mean, believe me, with my mind, I could do that. I mean, I love to create a religion. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm jealous of the yahoos, you know, and the yayas, you know, and the sacred gamers, you know, and all these other gamers that are, you know, out there playing on the internet, you know, coming up with these ridiculous, you know, sites. Oh, it looks professional, so it must be true. Ha <laughs> ha. Folks, new sites. You know, I love Russian Times. 
because you already know they're not going to tell the truth, or all the different people paid by, you know, backdoor Russia in order to come up with conclusions that, hey, let's criticize this, that, and the other thing, and use disinformation, famously done in Europe constantly, because a lot of the newspapers never claim to be accurate. They claim to attract your attention. They are the National Enquirer of News overseas. They know these certain newspapers aren't true. They're just like if I told you National Enquirer. You know it's not true, but you're going to read it anyways, and you're going to think, well, maybe, because after all, why are we buying it? Why does it catch our attention? Tickling ears. But you see, you can't do that in prophecy. You are a false prophet if you're not 100% spot on. 100% right. Not one degree of separation between you and the truth. That's truism, that's fallacy, those are false things we will help you to be prepared for that you already have in your faith. You already have them in your church, you already have them in your life, you already deal with it in American society. America is based on fallacy. The biggest fallacy that we have in America is our founding father. You know, I can't even... <laughs> If you've ever heard anyone use the word founding fathers, whatever comes next is a lie. I mean, it really is. I mean, I've heard so many statements about our founding fathers. Not one of them comes up and says, hey, you know, our founding fathers were slave owners. Our founding fathers were greedy businessmen. Our founding fathers were manipulating the system so that they could provoke the everyday people into following something where they would not be able to vote, but that the people who were smart enough and the people who were wise enough and the people who were intelligent enough wouldn't choose the wrong person in Congress or in office of the presidency, but we would have an elector so that they would make sure that nobody could just completely bamboozle or hold at gunpoint people to vote. So we came up with electors and we came up with the Electoral College and that would work if we didn't have a two-party system. And the founding fathers, dare I say, using the same fallacy term, already stated in each one of their years as president, if we are stuck on a two-party system, it doesn't work. Democracy fails in a two-party system. So where did you get your facts from? I grew up with this in high school and knew this. I read their works, letters, and now we've got evangelical Christians rewriting history and teaching their kids, hey, you know what, the founding fathers were like this. I read some of those things, you know, and I go, nah. That must be why Jews don't listen to Josephus, you know, as far as being a historian. <laughs> you know, because there's a certain amount of collusion Josephus had with the Romans to, you know, kind of spin Rome a little better than it was. You know, he was hired, he was a slave, so, you know, if he didn't write it, he'd be dead, but ask Jewish historians about what they think of Josephus as far as being an accurate historian. Well, you know, and these are things we base faith upon. you got to watch it. Some things, you know, there's going to be a little slip here and a little slip there, a little angle here and a little angle there. So you got to watch your historians even. And today, in our age of information, we have disinformation from Russia, we have disinformation from medical people. A lot of people like to say pharma. A lot of people like to say Monsanto. They like to claim genetic engineering is by Monsanto or by pharma or by some evil cabal that's you know here in America to make money and is corrupting our natural homegrown products. Made in Israel. Ooh. Genetic engineering comes from Israel? But we love Israel! We'll stand with you, Israel! You sold genetic engineering to Pharma, to Monsanto, to... You mean genetic engineering comes from Israel? You ever been to Technion? You ever done the research? You ever even bothered to pay attention? In other words, people are easily swayed by lies and deception faster than they are by facts and truth. That's why here at Prophecy America, we don't expect you to believe us because we won't lie. Now, I'm not going to disagree that I'm a pretty damn good liar. I am. I mean, 
You know, I'm going to confess to you a, a sin I have that I still do if I was, you know, working, but I'm in the ministry, but so, you know, because I'm in the ministry, I'm not working. It's funny how that works, isn't it? Some people think that being in ministry means you don't work. Whew. They ought to try being in this ministry. <laughs> I get paid a lot of bucks. Hear that, Lord? <laughs> no, 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 I don't want it. No, 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 go send me a fish with a gold piece in it. I know I could get that on my own. But don't go send me any prosperity. Good God. Those prosperity people are evil. Now, can you be prosperous in the Lord or finances and, you know, be following Jesus? Yeah, but can I ask you a question? When you stand before the judgment seat of Christ and you're prosperous, do you think any of that's going to benefit you? Do you think any of that was given to you to make you have a comfortable life? I don't know in the 300 years of church history that any of Jesus' followers were prosperous. I do know that they, being privileged to become martyrs, were happy to be caught by Rome, go into the gladiator's pit, be forced into the Colosseum, and torn apart by lions, singing songs of freedom that they were at last free and going home to be with Jesus. Eric Nelson, I want to find that song that he sang on the same album with Michelle Pilar, but he sang the song, the martyr song, and it said, Singing songs of freedom, marching in the darkness, or something, marching through the night, Doo -doo 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 -doo. casting forth the light, and I heard the prince of darkness fall, trembling at their sight. It's just, I get goose, I, you know, I got, right now I got goosebumps, I got the Holy Spirit going, woo, you know, and I'm going, woo, you know, I'm ready to babble and rabble on you, you know? <laughs> no, I won't do that to you. Um, speaking in tongues is no big deal, by the way. It's, yeah. You know, if you don't speak in tongues, it's not a big deal. If you do speak in tongues, it's not a big deal. So don't get a big deal about it. You know what I mean? It's no big deal. Believe me. It's not a big deal. But, Woo! <laughs> the Holy Spirit's a big deal. The Spirit of God is like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yo, dude. You know, I mean, don't get me wrong. I do not believe in the vineyard experience of being slain in the Spirit, but I can tell you, when I got saved, I was so wowzers that my face changed. I mean, I was glowing when I came home from my salvation experience, you know. I mean, just like the people that I was around that were glowing. I mean, it was back in the day when... Calvary Chapel Riverside was a tiny little church, if you could ever imagine that day. Huh. And it wasn't even called Calvary Chapel Riverside today, because it's called Harvest. But back then, yeah, it was called Calvary Chapel Riverside. And Greg was just, you know, Greg. Only you didn't know it was Greg because he had hair. <laughs> imagine that. Greg Laurie with hair. Down to there. Yeah, way down. So did I, come to think of it. Wow. Things and times, they are changing. Maybe we should grow our hair back. Maybe that's the problem. But, whew, did I have an emotional experience? Maybe it's because I'm Jewish. I don't know. But I thought everyone did. So I kept my mouth shut, you know, if you can believe that too. For about, oh, I don't know, about three years, I was pretty quiet. Well, I, as soon as I got saved, I started t talking about Jesus. I mean, I, you couldn't shut me up about Jesus. You know, I t came running home to my mother and said, Mom, you can be born again. Even though, you know, you may be an ex-Catholic, an ex-Protestant, whatever you might have been, you could be born again. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. You must be born again. And Jesus said, come unto me, and all you that are heavy laden, I will give you rest. And that today is the day of salvation. Harden not your heart in the sense of provocation, but today you could be saved and know that you're going to eternally be in heaven with God. And you won't have to fear death or hell because you don't have to go there. But if you don't repent of your sins and you don't take up your cross and follow Jesus, then you're going to find yourself in the pits of hell and you're going to be cast in the lake of fire forever in torment and you don't want to ever be there and God loves you so much that he gave his only begotten son to other believers and should not perish but everlasting life and now you can ask for God to come into your life and you can have Jesus in your heart and Jesus in your life and Jesus speaking to you and Jesus left and right and my mother said go to your room I went okay <laughs> believe me I was a Jesus freak <laughs> if that little spiel couldn't get you there what do I got to do to convince you I was a Jesus freak show you my Dumping heart? <laughs> Those were the days, my friends, we thought they'd never end. We'd sing and dance forever. Oh, I guess that's a secular song. But you see, I went out and I 
broke all my secular records, LPs, that people today go, man, remember when so-and-so? And I go, no, I don't. Because you see, I walked away from the world. I put aside my idols. I got rid of it day one. Literally. Physically. Smashed them. You know, I still wanted to listen to Neil Diamond, but, you know, huh, I was one of that, those kind of guys. The only guy I ever listened to was Neil Diamond, you know. Maybe Barbara Streisand, you know. Okay, so Jewish. But we had, you know, Love Song and Mustard Seed Faith and Parable and Wing of a Prayer and all kinds of people. Keith Green was running around and Keith Green told us, you know, get rid of all that stuff. So I got rid of it. You know, it's like, hey, you know. And 40 days, literally, after I, you know, got saved, at some little kind of like we're sitting in a little home now that Video Church is. Funny how it went full circle. Video Church is here in a home, you know, in a place, in a living room, living and alive, full of the Holy Spirit. In a little, you know, home Bible study that was there, you know, and I don't know who was leading it. Somebody invited me to go. I went there. They said Jesus was there. I said, okay, you know, studied. We were, I don't even know where we were studying. You know, I don't remember because I, something happened in the middle of the Bible study, you know. Something happened while I was sitting in a circle on the floor. Something happened that I can't describe any more than you can, you know, except for that, wow! An hour later, I was sitting in a chair babbling my full tongue off, you know, and I don't know what I was saying. I mean, I do now, but I didn't then. But I was just repeating, in some ways, one thing, but then I went off and repeated other things, you know, and said other things. But I was like, it was there, baby, speaking in tongues and going for it, and I had one believable knowledge Wisdom, word, I'm just going to say, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, you know, prophet, prophecy, gift of prophecy. I mean, there were things that were operating in me. I didn't know what they were even called yet. My buddy who had gone there to have it happen to him was pissed off, literally. And I was just like, you know, I didn't know what was going on. I glowed. I felt like I was walking three feet off the ground. Or other people told me that, you know, and I would, you know, I people got healed. People, you know, signs and wonders accompanied me. I mean, it wasn't a question of, did I pray, you know, in the name of Jesus? I didn't pray right. I didn't say right. I didn't do right. It just did it by way of it coming out of me, flowing forth like living waters. I didn't have a question as to what it was. Later, as I went through some negative experiences, the Marine Corps, you know, got out from there. God took me out, you know, by way of incurable disease. Um, I wound up at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, finally learning facts going through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, going seven days a week to Bible studies. Seven days a week, twice on Sunday. Maybe five times on Sunday. You know, kind of different. I think I went twice on Monday too, but anyways. But you know, going all that time for about two years. You know, so I got a pretty in-depth study all the time. Matter of fact, speaking of prophecy, I cut my teeth on Chuck Smith, Chuck, Smith, Chuck Missler. Chuck Missler had just come over to Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa, and was teaching on Monday night. Hey, you know, I mean, you guys, if you don't know Missler in the early days, he's right on. I mean, I don't know what he's into now because his wife died and all kinds of things went on. And I think he went off on a tangent, maybe kingdom stuff. I don't know. But all I can say is, yes, I got that. And I was not only one who was sitting there going, wow, or understanding. I was the one who was asking questions and taking down the notes and researching where he got his facts from and coming back with things to him. You know, the thing that set me off into prophecy was that after a particularly important Sunday night of Chuck Smith teaching, wow, what a man of God. I mean, <laughs> that's all I can say. What a man of God. I mean, I don't care where you go, where you are, where you were, when, but wow, what a man of God, you know. Um, didn't get close to him, but anyway, the, the closest I got to him was after a particular um, Sunday night service. He used to stay in the back and, you know, let people come up and ask him questions. And I went up the middle aisle, waited in line like everybody else, and I had my Bible open, you know, kind of like almost as big as this Bible, you know. I mean, I had a Bible at that time. It was, no, it wasn't this big. It was, I think I still have it, or it looks like it. It was the open Bible, matter of fact, you know, the original open Bible, which I still have one. Um, yeah, not that it's a big deal. It's just called the open Bible. But King James, who cares? I don't really care about King James one way or the other. It's just I like poetic, and it goes closer to what I understand the phrases to mean. Because some of you don't understand that Hebrew is a language of phrases that sing songs, that probably in heaven things are sung, not spoken. But we won't go there, and we'll discuss that till later in Prophecy America. But in this segment, we're talking about 
the introduction. So I had my Bible in this hand, and I had kind of like my strong... I always carried a backpack. I had my strong concordance over here, you know, and I kind of like shuffled it over here. And then I had this uh, picture, you know, of, uh, of the um, temple in Jerusalem, schematic, not the actual temple, but, you know, laying out on the ground. And at that time, in those days, the before the, I forget which series he was going through on the Bible, but we had gotten to the place where, you know, I was talking about the temple, and Chuck Smith said, well, the commentaries say, and Chuck Smith was wonderful, because he'd say, the commentaries say this, this says this, I don't think so, I don't know, if the Bible doesn't say so, we don't go so, so we don't do that, but this is what I think. And so he'd tell you what he thought, he didn't say that it was law, you know, he didn't say that all Calvary's have to do that, or whatever. Chuck had a lot of times just simply letting the Holy Spirit lead you the way he was going to. He said, look, Holy Spirit teaches you something, you'll go that way. You know, well, if we see it, watch it, and bear bears fruit, we'll go with you. That's why Vineyard could go off on a tangent, you know, and he could accept Vineyard back when they finally got off their tangent, you know. Because they went worship first, word second. Calvary's were more word first, worship second. Or worship sets up for the word, either way. However you want to look at it, but the priority was the word. For us... Jesus is the priority. The Word is one way of the revelatory way of knowing Him, but that's not the only way to know Jesus. Jesus could walk out of heaven and stand before us, and that's another way. But the point being is this. I'm coming up to Chuck Smith, and I said, You know, Chuck, I said, it says here in Ezekiel 42.20 that there should be a separation between the holy and the profane. And so then I just kind of, I didn't set it down, but you know, just imagine, if you will, that I kind of moved off to the next part, and I said, you know, the separation says, you know, it could be a wall, but it could be other things, but it could be a wall separating the dome of the rock from the grounds that we could find the temple to be built on. Is it possible that maybe like a future treaty could be the dome of the rock doesn't have to be destroyed, doesn't have to be torn down, or an earthquake happened, like, you know, there's popular teaching back then with that, a giant earthquake will come out, you know, and... 6.8 on the Richter scale will devastate, you know, um, Jerusalem and the Dome of the Rock will collapse and then after that, you know, the Antichrist will come on and make a peace treaty to rebuild Jerusalem and they'll start and build a, on the side of the Dome of the Rock, they'll start and build a temple instead of a dome and everything will be fine because uh, Moscova, Moscovasa, you know, wasn't that important. Yada, yada. You know, and I mean, in those days also they were saying that, you know, um, lightning would strike it I mean, this was before Jenkins, this was before Left Behind, the, well, Left Behind movie had come out, you know, um, the first one, Thief in the Night. Cross in a Switchblade was just becoming popular, if you, can, if you want to know time frame references, you know, of the events. So, here I am, you know, some little punk kid out of nowhere with long hair streaming down, kind of maybe oily, I don't know, because I lived in my car at the time in the parking lot of Calvary Chapel until, you know, the Romaine had chased me out or somebody, you know, come up and I'd start heading off the off the grounds, you know, to go somewhere else and sleep in the parks in Orange County, run out of almost every park in Orange County by police officers until finally I moved in with some Christian roommates. But, you know, at that time, living in my car, 68 Ford stage wagon, you know. <laughs> hippie, <laughs> literally. I was. That's <laughs> what so I was, a Jesus freak hippie. So, here I am telling Chuck, asking Chuck, I'm asking Chuck and I'm shaking in my booties because, you know, this is Chuck Smith. You know, and it was, I mean, I, I lay down on the ground, you know, Sunday nights, right down and pro looking up at him, you know, and listening to what he's teaching, you know. But I wasn't in awe of him. I was just in awe of the man himself, you know, because it was like, mm, you know, kind of, he's bald and I got long hair, you know. So, anyways, so, you know, I t told Chuck, and Chuck opened his Bible as I was saying it, and, you know, flipped it open, looked over, he looked at it and read it himself in his own words. And I had explained that, you know, I think that, you know, the dome would be, you know, the dome could stay standing and that it could be here and it would be a fulfillment of this prophecy. And he says, he started, he was look, looking, and he didn't grab his chin or nothing, but he was looking, and he was holding his Bible, and he was kind of pointing, and he was nodding while he was reading it. And then he said, it could be. He says, I'll have to look into it. He says, but it could be. Man, I went out of there like I was, you know, um, Kangas Khan had taken over Russia, or, <laughs> I don't know, I, I went out of there singing at the top of my lungs. You know, in those days, I could sing somewhat, you know. Um, singing top of my lungs, joy filled, dancing, prancing, you know, and it was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He loves me, yeah, yeah, yeah. He loves me, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I just thought it was the greatest thing in the world. And the first time that Calvary Chapel, and the last time that Calvary Chapel ever had a joint 
high school and college and career retreat up at the conference center, the teacher's conference center that had just been bought. I went on that, the only retreat I've ever been to. Um, and uh, everybody was out playing volleyball, you know, and all that stuff, you know. And I remember Chuck Smith coming in, you know, and giving a teaching on Christians driving Porsches or driving Harleys. Of course, now Calvary Chapel pastors all have Harleys, but back then, he mentioned it and everybody got rid of it, you know, I mean, because, you know, they weren't, they, they knew what he meant, you know. So, you know, people had driven up to the conference center in their wealthy cars, because, you know, it's Orange County, the OC. And so, um, you know, they were out there playing their games, you know, and doing volleyball and everything else. Well, I was poor. I was a poor man filled with the Holy Spirit working at the Calvary Chapel tape lending library with Maddie and Eileen before they put some pastor in charge of it. But, you know, back then it was like really anointed and appointed and growing. We were sending out free tapes everywhere. You could get the tapes free. We even paid shipping, you know, which is kind of trippy, but we did. Um, so we would, you know, just sending out tapes around the country. Nuns would come in. Pastors would come in. Priests would come in. People would come in those doors. People never imagined came in those doors. I know. I worked there constantly. You know, every day, Monday to Friday. And then sometimes I sneak in on the weekends, you know, to help duplicate and make labels and, you know, mailings and also putting tapes away because, you know, you'd come in and get your bag of tapes, you know, go back out. Some people remember that, you know, while I'm talking. Some people don't even know what a cassette is. <laughs> I would even fix cassettes. I'd take them apart and try to work on them sometimes, you know. And I was also listening sometimes to them because we would get Firefighters for Christ tapes in there. We had a section for Firefighters for Christ. Women's studies, Chuck studies, Holy Spirit series, you know, Bible, through the Bible series on that wall. Facing the counter, that wall. Over there was um, the wraparound. I can't remember. Holy Spirit series was one of the other gondolas. But, you know, you'd get one there and then we'd have to replace it. So we were making copies, scraping off labels with, you know, scissors, you know, and typing them up, you know, putting labels back on. I mean, it was wonderful in those days. But the point of it being is that Chuck Smith started me on my journey of studying prophecy. Because before it was kind of like, yeah, I read Late Great Planet Earth. That had just come out, you know. Um, a lot of people had wrong ideas about the destruction of the Dome of the Rock. And you notice it's not really said anymore, you know. I mean, but believe me, back in, way back in the 70s, you know, it was like big news. The Dome of the Rock's going to be destroyed, going to be destroyed, going to be destroyed. Funny how they don't talk about that anymore. You never heard of, back in those days, anything to do with Islam at all. I mean, we you did in America, basically, Black Panthers, you know, uh, uh, Sirhan Sirhan, I mean, you know, things left over from the 60s. But you didn't hear about some fear of Muslims or Muhammad or, you know, any of that stuff. Kingdom of the Cults was big. Walter Martin was teaching on it. He had people come on the radio program and he would, you know, do his thing. And, you know, it was kind of a confrontational, sometimes aggravational. I wouldn't recommend doing it his way, but, you know, he did, you know, and Chuck Messer came out of Walter Martin's ministry, you know, and, and then had his own ministry, but his early starts were there at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa and at the Monday Night Studies, which is what I went. So, as I was growing in all this knowledge, God kept blessing me because I just did it for him to know him. I didn't know people didn't know things. I went to the Jewish Gentile Fellowship there at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. A tiny little group, you know, but still, you know, some Jews, you know. Then one year, um, Chuck Smith let a woman teach men um, the book of Mal Matthew that she taught it from a Jewish perspective. She taught how the, the three sets of seven were memory tricks that were used in Jewish culture to speak orally the history that is written for us literally on paper, but in those days was repeated by way of hearing it, just like you hear of storytellers in native tribes that can repeat all the history of their culture and their native way of remembering history. And she taught us that from Matthew and went all the way through it. I was like, wow! And I knew how much I didn't know then. Then I began to explore my Jewish heritage because I wasn't raised Jewish, I wasn't raised Catholic, I wasn't raised Protestant, I wasn't raised anything. I got saved in 1974. God opened the door. <laughs> and there I went through, you know. Whoo. But I didn't go because I was guilty or I was in sin or I had drugs or I was bouncing off the four walls like Mike McIntosh or, you know, J Greg Laurie, you know, whatever he was doing, you know, or or Raul Reese or, you know, um, go through theology school like um, John Corson. But... What God did with me alone 
the miracles, the miraculous events, the circumstances. There isn't anything you read in here I don't know that I didn't experience. You know, when you say, you know, Paul went to heaven, oh yeah, I agree. I can say, you know, the books are wrong, but I say it's not wrong because of the Bible, I say it's wrong because of me. I write and talk about what I've experienced, not what others have told me about. If I haven't proved it to myself or talked to Jesus about it and had the Holy Spirit confirm it in some way, you're not going to hear it come out of Prophecy America or me in any way, shape, or form. That which I have seen, that which I have heard, that which I have handled with my own hands, even the Word of Life, the Word of God, the Bible, and lived it, breathed it, put it to the test, proved it, demonstrated, and risked humiliation, even when I used to do, sh and I still do it occasionally, but you're going to hear something called shotgun Bible, where, you know, God, God speak to me. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, even unto God with my voice, and he gave ear unto me. That's shotgun Bible. That fits what we're trying to demonstrate about God speaking by way of it fitting what's going on in the circumstances when you need it. And you open it up and there it is. Consider thou not what this people have spoken, saying the two families which the Lord hath chosen, he hath even cast them off, thus they have despised my people that they should be no more a nation before them. I mean, my God, I used to, you know, not do that daily or anything, but when it came to God telling me to confront someone, when it came to God saying, look, you don't hear God speak? Let me show you. You don't know that God can speak directly to you? Let me do this. And then, to cap it all off after a couple years, Um, Jesus spoke directly to me. And I'd love to tell you that changed my life. If anything, I was spiraling into sin. But no, um, no doubt, audibly, it was Jesus. No doubt about what he said. No doubt about hearing his voice. No doubt about knowing it was Jesus. No doubt. And... Uh, from that moment on, I took about five years of never mentioning it, never talking about it, never testifying or teaching or preaching until I was sure that I could handle the cost. You know the cost, you know, being called a crackpot or being labeled a idiot or a fool or mentally unstable or whatever you want to call it, any of those things, but not from non-Christians mainly, although they do that too, but from my own closest brethren. Even my own... Well, you know, it's funny because my own family never did doubt that. I mean, they didn't doubt. Well, okay, Chick did. Chick is my sister. Um, I guess Chick might have, but she never said anything. Uh, Chick, if Chick didn't know, she shut up. You know, she asked my mother. And I'm sure my mother backed me up because my mother... Contra what's interesting is that I was the first one saved to my family and then I witnessed to my mother, I witnessed to my sisters and after I was gone, despite me, and I always say despite, not because of me, despite me they got saved. Because, you know, I was like too excited, too, too all wrapped up in it and emotional to allow them to say anything or do anything or be anything. I was like blasted them, you know what I mean? Sure, I was loving and joy-filled and just like all oh, excited and wonderful expression of joy. I mean, my gosh, you know, was I joy. Joy, 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 But that doesn't mean I was precluded from sin either. Because, you know, I've been through more than one marriage. You know, I don't lie. I don't deny it. You know, I married for the wrong reasons and that's why it ended eventually, you know. I didn't start it or initiate the ending of it, but it happened to me. I was delivered with divorce papers, and while I was dying on a hospital bed, I signed them. You know, the police officer that came in, that um, or officer of the court that came in and delivered them to me, his face went white as a ghost. He apologized profusely. He said, oh, God, I'm so sorry. And he handed me the divorce papers, you know, and I looked them at him, and I was being shipped out the next day to... Um, the VA hospital in Roseburg that eventually I'd wind up in Portland um, and I didn't know if I was going to live or die and uh, I signed him in the story 
The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now I've also done other things that were wrong in marriage and, you know, rebounded and married again and failed. You know, I mean, there are things that I failed until whom God hath joined together, let no man tear apart or take apart or remove. And when God put my wife and I, Lori Evans Stone, with me, we did know it was God that put us together. No doubt about it. You know, she didn't follow my lead. I gave her all the options to learn on her own. And when it was time, we married. And so, don't presume that the vessel God uses is perfect. But the message that God gives is. And that's why in Prophecy America, God used an imperfect people to bring out a perfect salvation. The Jew. And I'm a Jew. In Prophecy America, we're going to talk about how, and we didn't get much into it yet, but we will very soon because we're going to keep building this up more and more as we keep going in Prophecy America. This is 1.1. 1 .1. Um, as we're as long as we're in introductory stages, it will have 1.1, 1 .1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So you can go in sequence. Once we get into some deeper things, it'll be 2 because we'll be on the second level, so to speak, of understanding. We won't have to repeat anything that was in one. You have to begin somewhere. In the beginning, God. So that's why we talked about all of this about God and what God has done in me, to me, through me, and is doing in America, to America, about America, and we will get to the place where we understand the office of the presidency as it stands right now, as we are teaching it today. Mr. Donald Trump is a archetype, archetype of the Antichrist. He is a perfect example of what an Antichrist will be like. It won't be the Antichrist coming up in Europe being a promoter of hate, bias, and bigotry in the way that Donald used it in America, but there will be disinformation involved. There will be deception involved. There will be wealth involved. There will be a con artist of types, salesman slash con artist, politician, in Europe that will rise, is already rising through the ranks and will become the fulfillment of the Antichrist, the false messiah, the one who makes a treaty with Israel and breaks it in the midst of the fulfillment of prophecy. He will not be Muslim. He will not come from Islam. He will be and have some type of Jewish heritage. He cannot fulfill prophecy and not be, in some ways, Jewish. Interestingly enough, one step removed is Donald. Donald is not Jewish, but he has a, as he says, a daughter that is Jewish. You know, she either converted, or she was, or whatever she did, but she's probably married to a Jew. She's supposed to be Jewish. But the point being, and Kirshner sounds like a Jewish name to me. <laughs> not that all Jews are, well, if he's a Cohen, uh, there's only there's only a few words in English that'll always be Jewish. Cohen is one of them. <laughs> Levi is the other. You know, sorry. Now it may be not Jewish because uh, you know black culture had a tendency of just using names from the Bible, so that could be true too. You know, last names. But usually a Cohen or a Levi is Jewish. Dare I say? You know, Stone. Yeah, there's you know that family tradition comes back from you know back east and from Germany and stuff, and according to my family tradition, I'm a, a scribe, you know, I'm a, a heritage of scribes, and the Bible says that, um, as far as the plus side of the scribe, which is interesting because I like to write, I'm a creative writer, I'm a author, I'm a, uh, I wrote lots of poetry, you know, um, songs, I've written lots of songs, um, written lots of things, you know, playwright, did a couple, um, would like to do a lot more, you know, but anyways, being scribal, Scribal, scribe, you know. Um, I even learned to ascribe things unto the Lord, but anyways, uh, that's a different play on words. And words are part of being a scribe, and knowing the Word of God is being a scribe, and knowing someone that's a, a, a sage would start off as a scribe and become a sage based upon the wisdom and experience that he's gone through. I'm sagely in a lot of things, you know. Maybe not a sage in Jewish culture, but a sage certainly in Christianity. No problem there. I mean, geez, you know, I'm even writing things about, you know, the 
the integral specificity versus systematic theology and which one is better or worse. And I'm all for integral specificity. I am not for systematic theology unless you just want to come to an intellectual conclusion. But my specific family heritage and cultural status comes from that idea of there being scribes in our family and that that was passed on from generation to generation. And as such, you know, it is um, more than obvious in the things that when Jesus said the scripture, I took it to heart and made it part of my personal little treasure chest of uh, Bible gems, if you want to call it that, or whatever, biblical truths. But he said, a scribe instructed unto the kingdom of God is like a wise man that bringeth out of his treasure chest, a householder that bringeth out of his treasure chest things both old and new. And that's why I am a preacher. Well, the other reason I'm a preacher and not a teacher is because God, literally, when I was called into the ministry and ordained, God said, you know, be in the ministry. And I said, well, he never said be in the ministry, but he, when I prayed about getting ordained, he confirmed that. But then once I was ordained, then I said, well, I'm not a pastor. And he said, no, you're not. You're a preacher. I went, oh, okay. And I said, that's it. And there was no question there. I agreed with 100%. I define pastor way more stringent than anyone I know, including all the Calvary chapels. You ain't, you know, I, I do it by a Jewish thought. If you ain't living and dying with that person that you're a pastor of, you ain't a pastor. That's what a shepherd does for a sheep. So, you know, that's not figurative. It's supposed to be literal. You should be there. If you're going to give marriage vows, you better be the one that keeps those vows with them. If you're marrying them, you should be burying them. That's why I'm not a pastor. Because I'm not going to grow up with you. Are you kidding? Go your way. I'm a preacher. <laughs> Do I teach? Of course, but I'm a preacher. There's no doubt about it. I mean, it's very clear and obvious. In style, in format, in literalness of the word, in figurativeness, in allegory, in simile, and in spirit and in truth. I'm a preacher. So, being the preacher at Video Church, and now being the initiator of this series, Prophecy America, being a I'll say, ascribe unto the Lord for ascribing unto God the words that are truth so you can understand the revelation of Jesus that God gave unto him so that you could understand what is about to happen in these latter days. I'll go there with you. I will tell you things that are fact that you can go back and research and you can look up and you can detail to yourself those things that apply for yourself. Because one thing you're going to find out in Prophecy... I mean, we've been saying a lot of things you're going to find out in Prophecy America, but one thing you'll find out in Prophecy America, if you don't believe in the rapture, it's because you ain't going in a rapture. So don't worry about it. You don't go out and try to preach rapture. That's not what a preacher does. He just tells you, look, watch for Jesus. I don't care if you're watching for the rapture, but watch for Jesus and be ready. That's it. Bottom line. Is there a rapture? Oh, yeah. We call it the event because everybody's made the word rapture into such a big deal. They never even thought to look in the Old Testament to find out if there's a word in the Old Testament that means rapture. Not solid. So, hey, you'll find that out in Prophecy America down the road. That's all, Hoshana. That's all, Hoshana. That's all, Hoshana. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Hosanna is Hoshana, which means save us now. It never meant anything else. That's all it means. Um, Natsal means to violently rescue, to snatch away, to come to the aid of, and to pull out as though by the skin of their teeth, or the skin of whatever you want to call it. But it's basically the same word as rapturos in Greek. Only one rapture is in the New Testament. Not solved is in the Old Testament. Funny how that works. People think it's made up by Darby or something. I don't know. But Prophecy America, now we'll end it with the point about where we'll begin it next time. Is that Prophecy America, the reason why we reversed it is because America is not in prophecy. You'll see me do that all the time. America is not in prophecy. Prophecy is in America. <clears throat> and what we mean by that is simply this. When you look at the trees and they're blowing in the wind, you don't see the wind, 
you see the effect of the wind on the trees. When you look at prophecy to be fulfilled in the world, you can look at America and see things that are similar or have effects of what's going to happen or is happening already in the world. I can look at Donald Trump and tell you that's an antichrist, but I can tell you for sure no way is he the antichrist, but he is a type of antichrist. What America is is a microcosm, and you'll hear that word a lot because it fits. America is a microcosm of the world at large. I prefer to say it another way, but people just don't seem to have the vocabulary these days. But for those of us who do have collegiate vocabulary levels and conceptualizations and understanding, America is a microcosm of the macrocosm of prophecy. America is a microcosm of the macrocosm of the world. America is a microcosm of the macrocosm of the kingdom of God. In other words, we are a type. We are a simile. We are a shadow of things to come. We are a metaphor. Hitler was not the Antichrist, but he was so close to being it, you can almost look at and say that's the Antichrist, except for this. He was military, and the military angle isn't going to come from the soon-to-be-revealed man of sin. He will be a politician. He will be a world leader. He will be a man of peace. He will look like act like karma incarnate. He will be, as it were, a man that inspires, a man that brings about the best in people, a man that can bring intolerable situations together and come to a conclusion that is caring, enduring, passionate, but not violent. He will somehow quell the violence of this age and bring about a short period of time of peace. He will totally be, in the beginning, possibly innocent. I hate that word, but he could be ignorant of his own destiny, but in the end he is filled with the spirit of Satan, the literal satanic possession of a man. Because God had revealed himself in Jesus, Satan will counterfeit it by revealing himself in a man. Evil incarnate will become literal in a man that will be presented as though an angel of light. Deceiving and being perceived as something he is not. And so, when I look at people telling me about Donald Trump being a Christian, I have to look at them and go, you know, it's almost like you can't say a word. It's almost like there's some evil spirit that seals your lips. Because literally, you can't stand in front of a tidal wave and stop it. I mean, I don't care who you are in faith. Say unto this mountain, be thou removed and cast it to sea, and it will. Well, yeah, it will, because guess what's going to happen? The Great Tribulation will come on and wipe it out. God didn't say when he'll fulfill your promise or prayer. He said he will, but you know he's no debtor to any man, so it ain't going to happen in your time, but you know it'll happen in his time. But Donald Trump, a Christian. Donald Trump, born again. Donald Trump, you know, they don't even say how he did it, but asking Jesus into his life. Donald Trump presented by wealth and prosperity preachers that even Christians don't like mostly, um, as being saved because they laid hands on it, they spoke the word of faith, they declared him to be saved, and I've never heard Donald Trump ever contradict his own statements about Jesus, much less say, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Huh. No man calleth Jesus Lord except the Spirit of God dwells within him. I'm waiting, baby. I've never seen a Twitter even about it. Because there's one subject he'll avoid, like the plague. And that's declaring himself to be a Christian at this time. Maybe in the near future he's going to come out, you know, because he's already hired all the right wealthy preaching Christians. Paula White, you know, is going to give the invocation. You know, who knows what Creflo will do or some of the other Pentecostal preachers. Or even how I could ever imagine some of the ones that 
are famous that have gone on board with him, in their blindness to follow and to get rid of President Obama, even Franklin Graham, which I already, you know, our ministry rejects Franklin Graham on all basis of anything he says, because 90% of the time before he's done finishing a speech, he's talking about politics and himself. Can't go there. Sorry. The anointing passed on to Ann Graham Lutz. Ann Graham, Billy Graham's daughter that married, you know, and her husband died. And she is a very pro advocate of prayer. She has been declaring that Jesus is coming. She is sound doctrine. She is obviously a wonderful Bible teacher. You can listen and be blessed out of your mind from her. So I listen to Franklin and I just get a bad taste in my mouth. Sorry. And then all the years that he spent on Fox and all the times that he said pretty much or let known where he wants to go, hey, give him a cabinet position. Let him be in charge of religion. You know, I mean, that's what the man wants. The man is not anointed of God. But the man is choosing to go his own way. Maybe he'll repent. I hope so. I know now so that no, he's not right on as far as the Word of God, the Spirit of God, the people of God, and all that. He was, when he started Samaritan's Purse, when he was part of BGEA, and he was going in the right direction. He's in charge of it now, but I don't support the direction he's heading at all. So people don't misunderstand me. Oh God, take your servant, Franklin Graham, and bring him back to you. Amen. There you go. See? I don't have a problem praying for people. I have no doubt people still make their own choices. God can save to the uttermost. Can God save America? Sure. We will enter into the kingdom of God with a blessing and not a curse. Before that, we may wind up with a curse because up until 2017, God shed his grace upon us and we got away with grace, not because of blessing Israel. That's also baloney story. But because God shed his grace upon us, because God did it. Period. That's it. It wasn't about, well, finally we support Israel, you know. Supporting Israel is a fallacy, and you'll find that out later in Prophecy America. Prophecy America will talk about all the lies that you've been told, you know, and we'll get into that. Don't want to, but we will. But Prophecy America wants to be about God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. Oh, God bless America. God bless America. Not as some salutation or annotation to my speech or reaching out somehow to incorporate the evangelical vote or the Tea Party or play at Christianity or religion, but rather in humility and sincerity, with a humble heart, reaching up with all those Christians who are doing the right thing, who are serving the living God, who walk with and talk with Jesus every day and want Him to make us more like Him in every way. May it be that God bless us today. So God bless America. And God bless you. On behalf of all of us here, I'd say staff, but they don't get paid either, so on behalf of all of us family here at Prophecy America, may it be that the Lord thy God give unto you the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, of realizing the truth that can set you free, that you can, in fact, hear God speak, and that Jesus himself will come to you and will open up the ears of your heart and the eyes of your understanding to give you a clear vision of who He is, what He is, and what He has done for you. And just how much He loves you, He cares for you, but He will disciple you. And He will cause the Holy Spirit to allow trials and tribulations in your life that you may be even one of the ones as the majority of Christians today in America will go into the Great Tribulation. May it be that He prepare you for the day that should you be raptured away or should you be left to live and die for Him in that way, that you find 
regardless of the day, you find Him being the way, the truth, and the life. From ages to ages, He has promised you eternity. The only thing I want for you isn't to follow us, but to follow Him. To live forever with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Yeshua Mashiach, Jesus, the one I have lived for, would die for, and want to be held accountable for in your eyes and mine, in the world's eyes and in the ears and in the eyes of all the angels that are gathered as a heavenly host watching, whether fallen or forgiven or faithful, doesn't matter. Eternity is living now in us and is watching for us to be revealed as the sons and daughters of God. Amen and amen. Omain may it be and so be it that we find ourselves such as that today.